Thank you for your presence, Lord. One of our number is sick, Robin, he's got a terrible flu. And I just want you to agree in prayer with me as we pray over this handkerchief and believe for God to heal her. So we thank you, Father, that uh, in Jesus' death, Jesus. we recognise yes, that by those stripes we are healed. Thank and Father, you. we have biblical evidence that said they, they took handkerchiefs of Paul and uh, touched their garments and touched Jesus' garments and they were healed. And so we just pray over this handkerchief, Lord, that uh, as Robin uh, steps up in faith, Lord, as she uh, asks for your help, Lord, that you will heal her of this flu, Lord, that you will take this flu right out of her body to be able to breathe properly again and she won't be coughing like she's coughing, the headaches will go and she'll be just totally released and we pray it through the precious blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Wow, isn't God good? I love it. I love it when His plan comes together. Um, sermons called uh, "Victory Walk." Has your victory been? <laughs> I'm glad it's been good. Um, you know, everyone has heard the uh, phrase: um, "No pain, no gain." gain. But does anyone know where it comes from? You know, it, it sounds contemporary, doesn't it? But guess what? Benjamin Franklin, the US president, wrote that. And he was one of the um, first guys uh, in the 18th century uh, to write that. He, he said, uh, there are no gains without pains. Um, and uh, he was one of the first exercise gurus in his diet book. He said um, um, that he recommended that adults get 45 minutes of exercise every day. And then guess who picked it up? Can you, can you remember? Can you guess who picked that, uh, that saying up, no pain, no gain? Jane Fonda, you know, in her exercise video in the, in the 1980s. And uh, it's a catch cry of most gyms, it's a catch cry of most training sessions at football, cricket, whatever. No gain, no pain, no gain. And, uh, you know, many people walk to exercise today. They, they walk for their own health. <coughs> they, they walk with friends and, and, and they walk for charity. And, and I remembered once we walked for charity. Um, Adelaide said, I'm going to do a walk. Would you sponsor me? And I said, yeah, I'll sponsor you. So I said, give me the money. I said, not till you've done the walk. <laughs> so I know what can happen on a walk. Anyway, we, we, um, we did this walk, um, a charity walk from St. Paul's in the city to the city of Mount Dandenong. And that's either 20 miles 25 miles, um, um, you know, it, it was just a long way. And we hadn't trained for it, we hadn't done anything, we were just our same old usual selves. And uh, so we were, what we were walking for was, um, this is typical white person, you know, thinking in Africa, we'll build a hospital. And so they built this beautiful hospital with operating theatres and everything, but it didn't have any running water. There was no running water, so they needed to pipe some water from a dam over to this hospital and, um, and uh, get it running. And so they needed a few thousand dollars to do that. And we started off at 6 p.m. at night uh, to walk, I think it was probably adds up to about 35k. And we walked along St Kilda Road and then we got to the end of St Kilda Road and we turned left and down Dandenong Road and that just seemed like it was going to last forever. And, uh, uh, we walked till the early hours of the morning. I think we, we got there about 1.30 in the morning, so that was seven and a half hours walking, basically non-stop, after no. walking, hardly at all. Um, you know, uh, some of our group, who uh, they tried to run on ahead, but you know they didn't make it. We saw them sitting on the side of the road or with the cars that helped people who weren't making it, and they were getting their feet looked at and all sorts of things. And um, uh, we just walked past them. You know, it's a tortoise in the hair thing. Um, 
and uh, it was just incredible and uh, we, we finally made it and uh, we, you know, we felt a little stiff when we got in the car, sort of like that. And, uh, but that was nothing to getting out of the car when we arrived home. Uh, my brain said to my legs, get out of the car, but they wouldn't move because I literally had to lift my legs out of the car, and John did too. Uh, and then we kind of stood there for a while before our legs would obey us again, you know, and uh, go into the house. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, it's, it's all right, it'll be okay. And, but the next morning, the same thing happened. We tried our legs to get out of bed, but they wouldn't move. I thought, well, I'll take a hot shower, that'll fix the problem, but no. Stiffness and pain had set in. You know, our bodies were in shock and uh, didn't want to do anything we asked them to do. You know, at the end of that walk, there was such euphoria, such happiness when we crossed the finish line. Uh, we'd done it. We'd finished. We'd completed the task. We'd raised the money that we'd been sponsored for. That was just an awesome feeling. But, you know, now we had to pay the price. Now we had to pay the price. And there were some people in church that had you know, done a lot of walking and they were fine the next morning. Um, but uh, uh, we had to pay that price. And uh, finally, as I said, the next morning we got mobile, uh, only just, and uh, we arrived at church and we could uh, tell everyone who'd been on the, walk, on the walk, they were slightly bent over and not moving very freely. <laughs> So this was um, young, youth, young adults, and uh, and adults. Um, you know, we looked like a pensioners' convention <laughs> all walking around the church. I'm a pensioner, so I can say that. You know, our victory was celebrated in the church. It was great, and those who, who, who by those who went and those who didn't. But our victory cost us something. There is no gain without pain, as Franklin said, and as Jane Fonda said, 300 years after. You know, Jesus of all people knew that there was no gain without pain. The pain was his and the gain was ours. The pain was his and the gain was ours. That's why we respond in praise and worship. We just thank him for who he is. Because without him we would have a bleak life. A bleak life. So let's look at this Palm Sunday. And what it's meant by Jesus, and I think Dawn read my notes, but she didn't, she tells me. Matthew 21, 1 to 11, the same scripture you heard read. Um, we were going to show something, weren't we? Yeah, we're waiting for you. Ah, let's do that now, before I start on the scripture. started shouting and dancing and singing and uh, 
Some people were throwing their coats in front of the donkey. There, there was, there was a, a, some of us that grabbed some palm branches and we started waving them in the air. And that's when it clicked. Jesus had finally arrived. And, um, I know that sounds weird. That's, it, no, it's, it's like this. Um, in the past, we would get excited because Jesus would do something a miracle or he, there would be some parable or something he said, we'd get excited about it. And Jesus would always be like, shh, come on guys, no, 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 just be quiet, you know. And then we'd come up with some idea, hey, let's do this or let's do that. And Jesus would, would be like, no guys, no, not, not now, not now. But today, <laughs> today was now. Today, he finally let us shout sing and dance and treat him like the Messiah that we've all been waiting for. He finally showed up. <laughs> ah, I don't know. Um, I don't know what tomorrow holds. Um, it feels like it's something big, but who knows, you know, but it doesn't matter what happens. Jesus showed up, and there, <laughs> there's nothing better than when Jesus shows up. <laughs> Amen. There's nothing better than when Jesus shows up in your life, and uh, we all have different testimonies about that, and uh, it's just uh, amazing when he shows up. So as uh, Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town Beth Page on the Mount of Olives. You see, I've been a Christian since I was 21. That's a long time, 40 years. And I never actually realised that they came to this town Beth Page. I just thought they were on the Mount of Olives. So there's not, you can learn something new every day. And um, it was a walled city. Um, that page is remembered as the starting point of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on, on, that, on that day. Um, it's still commemorated um, to this day as Palm Sunday. The exact location of the village on the, on the eastern slope of uh, the Mount of Olives near Bethany is still unknown. But uh, Beth Page was considered the outermost limits of the city of Jerusalem. It was actually down the valley. Um, on the other side of the hill, but it was uh, considered part of Jerusalem and uh, the limit of the Sabbath day journey, 2,000 cubits or 900 metres. So in other words, you could, so you weren't allowed to walk on the Sabbath, but you could walk up to 900 metres to go to the worship. Um, and they could bake bread in Beth Page and carry it to um, the temple for the worship. They could... Um, do stuff there. Um, and the name in Hebrew means house of unripe figs. And remember it was um, this area where Jesus cursed a fig tree that had no fruit and it withered and died straight away. So Jesus sent two of them ahead. Go into the village over there, he said, and as soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its cob. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say the Lord needs them and he will immediately let you take them. No, he didn't steal the cot. He didn't steal the cot. He, he borrowed it. He asked to borrow it and it was okay. And Matthew speaks of two animals here where the other evangelists refer only to the cot. Um, the actually sound of Mark tells us um, the cot had never been written before. So the mother um, was probably brought along to help control the cult that Jesus rode on. Or probably just obey Jesus. And verse 4 says, This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, Look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's cult. And... Uh, 
the humility that Jesus had uh, was not um, some kind of weakness. It was strength. Uh, he had a strength that uh, I'm sure none of us actually have or could have, but he had an incredible strength because he knew what was coming. He knew what was coming. Verse 6, the two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt and he sat on it. And most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The king's subjects uh, paid homage to him by providing a carpet for him uh, to ride on. And the truth is that everyone who uh, calls upon the name of the Jesus, uh, calls upon the name of Jesus, must place everything they own or hold dear under his feet. We have to surrender everything we have to Jesus under his feet. Like Adelaide said, you know, it's our responsibility to go out and share with people and bring them in. You know, if that means that we have to get over our shyness and become bold, we've got to put that shyness under Jesus' feet and become bold. Amen. And, and as that video showed so clearly, Jesus was in the centre of the procession and all the people around him were singing, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, hallelujah in the highest heavens, or praise God in the highest heavens. And hallelujah means save now. It's more than a cry of acclamation. It was a plea from an oppressed people uh, to their Saviour for deliverance. They wanted to be free of the Romans, but as Dawn said, Jesus' kingdom was not a political one. And, you know, uh, hallelujah, blessed be the name of the Lord, became the standard praise, uh, the shout of praise. Psalm 118, verse 25 and 26. Praise, the, uh, please Lord, please save us. Please Lord, give us success. And verse 26 says, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you want to be blessed? Go out in the name of the Lord. Tell people about Jesus. Lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Pray for the demonically oppressed and see them delivered. That's why I want to bring my chicken today. But I forgot. We have to step over the chicken line. You know, when our heart's fluttering, uh, that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit's on us in that situation. It means that we're scared of that. Uh, being identified with Jesus. We're scared. We're big, strong men, but we're scared. We're assertive ladies, but sometimes we're scared. And uh, you know, Jesus identified for us, which we'll hear on Good Friday. So this uh, quote um, from Psalm 118 is uh, part of a messianic uh, passage. And therefore the people were publicly acknowledged Jesus as their Messiah. They still thought the Messiah was a political king come to set them free. And uh, the entire city of Jerusalem was in uproar uh, as he entered. And who is this, they asked. And uh, the word uproar in the Greek is often used for an earthquake. So it was really shaken. The city was really shaken. Like Darwin was shaken when Cyclone Tracy hit it. That's what shaken means. When people are wandering around bewildered saying, what is happening? What is happening? You know, when JFK was killed, I remember people would just say to one what is ha what's happened? How can this happen? That's the kind of shaking uh, that Jesus had when he came into Jerusalem. And, you know, as that's video so aptly put it, um, you know, now he was letting us see who he was. He was parading it, if you like. The 
people were in uproar because their saviour was there and his enemies, the religious ones, were in uproar because they were offended and they were jealous of his popularity. They were jealous of his acceptance. Because he, he brought relationship, not religion. And they were stuck in their religion. You know, if you're stuck in your religion, get out of it. Get into a relationship with Jesus because that's the only thing that will save you in those times when you cry, Lord, save me. Religion can't help you. It's just words. Relationship is power and life in the Holy Spirit. In verse 11, the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from, of Nazareth from, in Galilee. What an arrival. This is literally what they did for their victorious kings. And now they're doing it for King Jesus. They're laying down their coats, palm branches, they're waving them. Uh, on the, they're laying the palm branches on the... It's all a sign of honour. What a victory procession. The king has come home riding on a donkey. A sign of humility. See, reacting pride and not humility. Yeah. Something gets up our nose and so we just... <laughs> but Jesus comes, riding on a donkey. And the palm branches were a symbol of victory. They were a symbol of triumph. They were also a symbol of peace and eternal life. The Bible calls Jesus. Uh, the Bible calls it Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Wow! Well, we know what happens to him in hindsight, don't we? But it's still a triumphal entry. You know, one week later, many of the same people, instead of uh, crying out "Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord," Lord you know, they were disillusioned. Judas. We believe was disillusioned, and and they they, they said, um, crucify him, give us Barabbas. In other words, if he's not going to be our political leader, crucify him, give us Barabbas. And Jesus knew all of this before he started on his walk. He knew all of this. He knew that there was no gain without pain, and Paul says that. While we were still sinners, He died for us. You know, His death means that we only fall asleep. He died so we could just fall asleep into eternal life. Jesus travelled the Mediterranean world on foot. He walked, um, walking to, to places where people like you and I could have a kingdom encounter. Where you and I can have a kingdom encounter. You know, the disciples on the beach, follow me. The woman with the issue of blood in the crowd. Zacchaeus, the tax collector, up in a tree. The Gentile woman whose daughter had a demon. The woman at the well, it had many husbands. They had a God encounter that changed their life. See, we could even call his walking around the Holy Land a victory lap. A victory lap. Because every time he went somewhere, he had a God appointment. <coughs> he rescued someone from the clutches of Satan and delivered them. And he said to us, go and do likewise. <coughs> go and do likewise. You know, all of these miracles, as the video said, were played down by Jesus because his time had not yet come. If you look at John's Gospel, someone urges him, you know, make the wine. He says, my time has not yet come. Uh, heal this person, my time has not yet come. But now, in verse uh, chapter 26, he says, my time has come. Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit had planned this from the moment Adam and Eve Disobey and brought sin into our world. They had planned our rescue, and it was going to happen uh, when the time was right, at the right time. And uh, and Jesus said, "Now my time has come." So on that first Palm Sunday, he looked back to a life of perfect obedience. The devil had no claim on his life. 
he had done the Father's will so far and he would see it through to the end, carefully fulfilling every prophecy made about him. That's why he rode the colt in to Jerusalem. Because Micah, I think it was, prophesied that he would do that. Your king is coming, riding on a colt, riding on an ass. I don't know, colt on ass. Yes, the colt on ass. There's no gain without pain. Benjamin Franklin coined that phrase 300 years ago. Jane Fonda popularised it 35 years ago. But Jesus lived it for us over 2,000 years ago. He lived it. And Jesus allowed everyone who would believe to see him as their Messiah and King that day when he rode in on the donkey. You know, that was one of the disciples who was meant to be speaking there. And they could see, yes, this is our Saviour, this is our Messiah. So what about you today? Who is Jesus to you? What does he mean to you? And how do you live your life in response to what he means to you? Are you serving him? Are you living for him? You know, we have a secular world we live in and we get locked into school, you know, uh, work. Working to go to university, then paying off our university. Then we think about marriage, um, or it could be you know any variation of that. But what about Jesus? What about His claim on your life? You know, only you can ask Him what He wants you to do, <laughs> and He'll tell you. Serious? He'll tell you. He's got a plan for you. <coughs> got a plan for you, Samuel. Have you ever had a prophecy? Oh, you can get one now. Uh, I just feel like the Lord's saying that as you are obedient to Him, you're going to come in uh, to baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're going to come into many gifts, and God is going to use those gifts here and in Africa in the years to come, also America going to go to America in the years to come. Uh, God is going to raise you up. But you, all you have to do is like the disciples. We did what he said. We obeyed him. See, that can mean letting go a lot of stuff that you might want to get into, music, all of that, you know, friends, partying, all of that. It could mean that you, you just get rid of all of that and concentrate on what Jesus wants you to do. And I say that because I love sport. And... Uh, God told me to forget civilian uh, affairs, to concentrate on uh, kingdom affairs. And twice I was asked to help out in a team, and I've got a bad attitude to winning. And every time I did, I injured myself. So I know that when God says to you that the other things fall away and move forward, if He says that to you, you do it. You be obedient, and you'll just. Every time we're obedient, he gives us the next thing to do. Okay? So God loves you very much. And uh, he's got a call on all your family. But that's for another time. If you can possibly go to this, please go to it. Take an unchurched friend along. Um, it's how we live our lives that matters to God. We'd also like you to come for breakfast. So you could eat out for breakfast, you could eat out for dinner. Really cool. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love. Oh Lord, we just uh, get elated with the disciples and the whole idea of you um, declaring your Messiahship, riding into Jerusalem to fulfill that prophecy on a donkey. And uh, we, we, we just uh, are in awe of that. Knowing what you knew now. And still you came for us. Still you were prepared to give your all for us. Help us to be prepared to give our all for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And you know why Jesus gave his all? Because he loves the house. He loves the house. And you are the Spirit of God in the house.